I recently upgraded from what was one of the most powerful Intel MacBooks to the mid-tier M1 Pro 16-inch. If you're comparing retail prices at launch, this new one I upgraded to actually costs less than the one I upgraded from but it undeniably still very much is an upgrade. So let's quickly talk about three things on the new Apple Silicon MacBooks that have taken these machines to a whole new level and ultimately forced my hand to upgrade. Unsurprisingly, first of the three things is performance. At this point, everyone's probably already quite familiar with how powerful the new M1 chips are, and I'm not even on the M1 Max. The Pro is already tremendously outperforming this i9. I primarily use my Macs for video editing in Final Cut Pro, and back then I would always use a proxy workflow just so that my timeline is responsive enough for me to edit on. On the M1 Pro, I was getting the same level of responsiveness without proxies and with playback set to higher quality. What completely exceeded my expectations was my timeline was still reasonably responsive even after I've applied my color grading to it. Compare this against the performance on the Intel and you can see there is a very clear gap. And here I'm trying to scrub through and play back a 120fps 4K H.264 clip. On the Intel, it is struggling so much to the extent of being barely workable without resorting to transcoding the clip first. On the M1 Pro, well, it doesn't even seem to be struggling. And of course, export times would be something everybody cares quite a lot about. Here I'm exporting a 7 minute video, fully edited with film convert nitrate applied for color grading. It's a very heavy timeline, and I'm giving both computers a pretty hard time by having background rendering disabled and having no optimized media present. Exporting it as an H.264 clip, the M1 Pro finished a fair bit ahead of the i9. But there's one more thing about the M1 that unlocks a whole new possibility, and that's working with HEVC exports. If you wanted to export something as an HEVC on an Intel Mac, it would take four ever, but on the M1, it's a completely different story. Here I'm exporting just a one minute clip. The source footage is HEVC and I'm exporting it as HEVC as well. So think an end-to-end -end HEVC workflow. It took my M1 Pro 34 seconds and 15 minutes for the i9. It's a tremendous gap and this previously meant exporting HEVC on an Intel Mac was practically not feasible, but now with the M1 Pro, it's become trivial. This next item I'm talking about is what ultimately pushed me over the edge to ditch my i9 for an M1 Pro, and that's how hot the laptop would get and how annoyingly loud the fans were. Now, as displeased as I was about how easily the i9 would get warm, I was equal parts astonished by how the M1 Pro was able to keep its cool so well. Here's a thermal camera pointed at the base of the laptops. I'm showing the base because that's what would be in contact with you if you were using it on your lap. i9 on the left, M1 Pro on the right. The laptops aren't doing anything heavy, just playing a YouTube video back on Safari. You can see it really doesn't take much before the i9 starts warming up, but look how on the M1 Pro, it barely registers any heat when it comes to performing light tasks. And now look what happens when we're rendering a video. The area around the touch bar on the i9 has a surface temperature of over 50 degrees. The M1 Pro does show some signs of heat at this point, but it's nowhere near as hot as the Intel. It's a very clear picture when you look at the heat map of these two laptops side by side. Quite often when I was using the i9 MacBook Pro on my lap, it gets unbearably hot to actually continue using. I've not experienced any of that on the M1 Pro yet. I also find it quite puzzling how I cannot hear the fans on the M1 Pro even when I'm rendering a video. I haven't had it kick in when I'm editing and not even when I'm exporting. Meanwhile, here's the i9 doing the exact same export. The fan noise on these Intel MacBooks have been particularly troublesome for stuff like video conferencing or live streaming or simply just recording a video with my laptop in front of me. It would always get picked up in the audio. So fan noise being something I don't really have to worry about is a massive plus on the M1 Pro. Now, I wasn't really gonna talk about battery life because it wasn't terrible on the i9 MacBook Pro to the point I felt it wasn't sufficient, but it's just too damn good on the M1 Pro for me to not say something about it. I remember editing an entire video all night on battery and the MacBook still had over 50% of battery left 
after I was done. It was about four hours worth of continuous video editing. I also did some more control tests. I exported a video with both MacBooks at 100% battery, so I can see how much battery does it consume to complete the export. It's the same seven minute 4K video I tested with earlier, and the M1 Pro didn't even go down by 1% after the export, which took about four and a half minutes. The Intel took almost three extra minutes to finish, but the battery had drained all the way down to 90% by the time it was done. It's worth pointing out that these two laptops actually have the exact same battery capacity, so all that extra battery life on the M1 Pro is simply down to the chip wasting less power. And now my final reason to upgrade from this to this is that display. Now, it's really nice that the new MacBook Pros have ProMotion high refresh rates, but what's more important to me is the fact that it's an incredible HDR display. It means so much to me because HDR content would simply be irrelevant unless my device has an HDR display. There's just no way around that. And it's more than just being able to consume HDR content. This MacBook, because of its display, is now an HDR content authoring machine. You can edit and publish HDR videos using this, knowing exactly what your results are supposed to look like. I've got a few other devices that do have spectacular HDR displays like my iPhone and my iPad Pro, but this MacBook is the only one that runs my primary NLE and that's Final Cut Pro. I'm actually still relatively new to this MacBook. I've only been using it for the past couple of weeks, but I'll be back to share more on it as I learn more about it. But so far, it has been an absolutely worthy upgrade over my previous MacBook Pro, and I'm glad to say I'm very happy with my purchase. Well, thus far at least. I hope I don't regret not buying the Max version. But anyway, if you enjoyed this video, maybe I'll see you in another one.